Friends, let me welcome you today to our Good Friday service from the Wodonga and District Baptist Church. Good Friday is one of those days I never really quite knew what to do with. You know, when I was at school as a young person, I'd look forward to having uh, Easter off. It was often in the middle of school holidays as, uh, as it has been this year. But what do you do on Good Friday for the last 20 or so years while I've been in ministry? It's been a case of preparing a service. And for reasons that I'm not really sure, uh, we normally do our service a little bit earlier in the day on Good Friday than we might normally do. Over the past few years, part of the practice that I've been involved in is to do a service and then go on a, a walk with other churches, kind of like a Stations of the Cross or a Good Friday prayer walk. Uh, but even as as a as a family, we're not quite sure what Good Friday is meant to look like. Are you allowed to do sport on Good Friday? There's a perennial kind of debate that goes on in the community. Is the, the shops are all closed. It's one day of the year when there's no trading going on. Are you allowed to do recreation? It's one of those days that we don't quite know what to do with. And in some senses, I guess, you know, reflecting on that, that kind of captures a bit of the sense of the day doesn't it it's a day even from a religious point of view from a christian point of view uh, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense and i'm going to talk a little bit about that with you today this crazy plan that god had to do something about the problem of rebellion against him in our world we're going to read some passages of scripture this morning through this service as part of our time together Today we're just going to do a very, very simple service. We're not going to have any music, no other activity, nobody else involved in our service. So I'm really just going to bring a brief reflection from the Word as we read some scripture, as we unpack a little bit about what that means, as we think about this crazy plan that God had to redeem people to himself. So turn with me if you've got a scripture, a Bible in front of you, whether a printed Bible like I'm using here, or on a device uh, that you might follow with me as we read. I'm going to read from the Gospel of Mark a selection of verses. We're going to start with verses 1 through to 3, then 12 to 16, and then 21 through to 41. So it's a bit of a chunk of reading, but it captures something of the flow of the story of Good Friday, which is a story that we need to revisit from time to time and just be reminded of the love that was expressed by our Lord Jesus Christ Through this day. So here we read from Mark chapter 15. Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin reached a decision. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? Pilate asked. Yes, it's as you say, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of many things. And across to verse 12. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. And from verse 21 through to verse 41. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him, dividing up his clothes. They cast lots to see who would get each piece. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him, among themselves he saved others they said let him save himself let this christ this king of israel come down now from the cross that we may see and then we'll believe those crucified with him also heaped insults on him 
at the sixth hour darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour and at the ninth hour Jesus cried in a loud voice Eli Eli lama sabachthani which means my God my God why have you forsaken me when some of those standing near heard this they said listen he's calling Elijah one man ran filled with a sponge with wine vinegar put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink now leave him alone Let's see if Elijah comes down to help him. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard this cry and saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph and, and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. Let's take a moment to pray before we spend some time reflecting on that passage. Let's pray. Father, this is a very solemn passage that we've just read. Out of the four Gospels, it's possibly the darkest, it's the briefest, it's the hardest, and it captures something for us of the solemnity and the seriousness, uh, the gravity and the awfulness of the crucifixion of Jesus. And today, on this day, Good Friday, we pause in your presence to reflect again on this day knowing that it is followed in just a couple of days by Easter Sunday when we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. But today, Lord, we pause and we give you thanks that you chose in your wisdom, in your sovereignty and out of your grace to die for us, to bear on your shoulders the pain of sin that we might be free. Lord, again we come and we say thank you for your gift of grace. We say thank you for your mercy uh, shown to us. We say thank you for your abundant love that we have experienced. May we be blessed today by your word, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I wonder how many of you might be familiar with a television program that's been quite popular for a number of years called The Gruen Transfer. I think it might have also been known as the Gruen Project, or perhaps even just colloquially known as Gruen. It's one of those programs that, uh, that kind of borders on the humour, although sometimes the humour is a little inappropriate, but it's a program that at its heart kind of plums the psychology of advertising, what it is that drives us and, and causes us to go out and buy a product or act in certain ways. And one of the parts of that program that I've always enjoyed uh, is when the host gives a couple of advertising agencies an impossible task. They're asked to actually sell a product that no one would normally want to sell. Something like uh, the idea that Australia and New Zealand should become one republic together or perhaps um, freeze-dried water, you know, something like that. I've actually got a, a great idea for them that they should have a crack at and it's this. What about Easter cards? Have you ever noticed how at the end of Christmas, all of the Christmas stuff is sold off really quickly? Everything's on special, 50% off, 70% off. Get rid of all of the paper, get rid of all of the decoration, all that kind of stuff. Christmas cards disappear. Out come the hot cross buns, out come the Easter rabbits and bilbies and Easter eggs and all that sort of stuff. But you know what? I've never actually seen an Easter card, but I've got a great idea for one. And it kind of looks like this. My vision for an Easter card is of a picture of Jesus dragging along uh, through the streets, carrying this cross, his back kind of bloodied and messed up by the whipping that he, that he experienced. His, his whole demeanour just uh, totally exhausted and carrying this awful cross. And then there's text on the inside which says, uh, whoever uh, would want to come after me must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. It's a, it's a winner, isn't it? I'm sure he'll agree. Well, then again, maybe it's not, and that might be part of the reason why it has never been a winner. And that could be part of the reason why 
we don't see Easter cards. You see, generally speaking, uh, people in our community are very happy to engage with Jesus, the baby, Jesus in the manger, Jesus with the angels kind of singing uh, hallelujahs over him, glory to God in the highest. You know, we can kind of manage this kind of Jesus. We, we're happy to live with, with a baby. We're happy to uh, have this Messiah in swaddling cloths. But this crucified Jesus, that's a bit more difficult. That challenges us. That makes us uncomfortable because, you know, babies we can kind of control. I'm, I'm talking, some of you, of course, are, are young parents and you'll be saying, what are you saying? I just wish I could control this child. But you put a baby down and basically you know where you're going to find them again, right? Uh, but you can't control a, a crucified Messiah. It's much more challenging. It's much more kind of out there. And this is one of the challenges of Easter, isn't it, as we face this question. What do we do with this crazy plan that God had that has been revealed to us at Easter? God allowing his son, Jesus Christ, fully God himself, to die on a cross between two criminals, to die uh, at at the criminal's death. The passage that I just read a few moments ago from Mark is, to be frankly honest with you, a really gloomy description of the crucifixion, isn't it? It's a dark, dark story that Mark tells. Mark kind of pairs away a lot of the other stuff that the other Gospels have. There's no affirming words from one of the the criminals on the cross like there is in the other Gospels, just abuse being heaped on Jesus. Jesus has been deserted by the disciples Uh, the people that he'd poured so much of his life and energy into. Uh, He was abused and rejected by his own people. He's been beaten, he was mocked, he was spat upon. There's no compassion there at the cross. Uh, There's no record of the relatives who stood by. There are some women around the cross who've supported him during the ministry. But they're kind of watching from a distance. There's this sense of dereliction in the in Mark's gospel this sense of abandonment by everybody including God that Mark is describing it's an ugly chapter of scripture isn't it really when you look at it but unpleasant and all that it is to reflect on even as we come to good friday it's good that we do that because you know it was only a couple of months ago that we were gathered together celebrating christmas and joyfully singing praise to god for coming into this world, the incarnation, the coming of God amongst us. And there's this thread that runs from that moment right through history, a thread that has its history way back, but a thread that runs from that moment when Jesus came into the world as a baby to this moment uh, fully revealed at his death. We know from the scripture that crucifixion was an awful, awful punishment. We know from a literature outside the Bible that crucifixion was an awful, painful, unpleasant manner in which people were put to death. The whole drama of crucifixion was actually so unpleasant, very few contemporary historians actually wrote about it. It was just that awful. What we do know is that after the criminal was condemned to death, it was the custom to flog them, to whip them, to inflict as much pain as possible on them in their weakened state. They usually had to carry the post, the pole, the cross that was used to crucify them, normally outside the city where they were crucified. Archaeological evidence that was found as recently as 1968 would show that the victim of crucifixion was normally stripped totally naked and so increasing their humiliation that the nails were put through the wrists and through their ankles so that there was no chance that they could tear themselves off that cross, that those crosses were often just rudimentary poles, perhaps like the one that we have represented here behind me, but more likely just a T, uh, not terribly high off the ground even, and sometimes uh, multiple people being crucified at once. To hasten the process of death, it was not uncommon for the bones of the crucified victim to be broken so that they couldn't support themselves and so the weight of their body fully on their shoulders and arms would bear down, constricting their capacity to breathe and so suffocating them. 
It was not uncommon for uh, bystanders to use some sour wine and perhaps in the case of Jesus that sour wine that was put to his lips was an attempt by those there to prolong his life to see whether Elijah would come and save him in that moment. It was an ugly scene and it's an ugly scene that it's worth us going back to sometimes even though it makes us feel squirmish and even though it might make us feel uncomfortable. If we have a look at the passages of scripture that come just before this one we see the opposition from the religious leaders building and then spilling out in this rage, this brutal, almost venomous kind of anger expressed against Jesus as though somehow the world has gone crazy. You know, it was only days before the crowds were laying down palm branches saying, Hail, you know, here he comes, the one. And now they've nailed him to the cross. This world has just gone upside down. This Messiah has been nailed to a criminal's cross. He's dying the death of an outlaw. He's been rejected by the people that he came to save. And he who had all of the power in the universe at his disposal has allowed himself to die on the cross. But when you think about it, this craziness actually started way back in the Garden of Eden, if you wind the clock back, way back to creation. This craziness started when Adam and Eve chose to disobey God. He placed them in this beautiful situation and they said, no, we know best. This craziness started when they rejected God's merciful grace, his provision for them. And so sin entered this world. And this craziness on God's part started in that moment because he made a way from that moment to reconcile those who had rebelled against him. This craziness is demonstrated in God's person when he selected Abraham. Have you ever thought about that, Abraham? He, he was just a farmer. I mean, that's, don't get me wrong. He was, he was a farmer in the back country of nowhere and God put his hand on him and God said, I know you are a man of faith. A kind of crazy God does that. This craziness that uh, is demonstrated again in God when he chose Moses, a man whose public speaking record wasn't that stellar and said, Moses, I'm going to use you to lead my people out of slavery. And he did. Craziness when God's royal line came through a shepherd boy, you know. Why on earth pick David, even those around Saul couldn't understand that. Why this guy? Why not someone who's accomplished someone who's a good warrior or whatever. This craziness that God uh, continues to demonstrate through history, craziness that was demonstrated in Bethlehem. You know, Jesus coming into the world, the Son of God no less. Why be born in such humble circumstances? This birth that took place in a stable, not in a hospital. This uh, birth that was witnessed by outcasts from society, not those who were noble or well-meaning and his teaching that was like nothing else that had been heard before crazy teaching too when you stop and think about it i mean can you imagine the response of the crowds when jesus would stand up and say blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth really the craziness of blessed are you when people persecute you i can imagine people scratching their heads and saying what are you talking about that's just upside down When someone strikes you on the right cheek, allow him to strike the left head income. What kind of craziness is that? And then, of course, as you look at the life of Jesus, we see his carriage totally unlike what might be expected. Crazy, really. He hung around with sinners and tax collectors. He touched lepers, for goodness sake. Crazy. And this craziness that ends up with his death, uh, death in a manner that was offensive to the Jews who would consider death on the cross as something that meant this person was under the curse of God. And yet there's a verse in here that I read from Mark chapter 14 which just draws this together and interestingly it's verse 39, it's found on the lips of a Roman centurion, a man who was commissioned to uphold the law of Rome and who said these words, surely this man was the son of God. And here we come again to the thing that Mark's been pointing to time and time again, Jesus, the son of God, the Messiah. 
this declaration more significant that we might, than we might realise. Defending the Roman Empire, that was this centurion's job and yet he identified Jesus as the Son of God. The Roman mind associated power, uh, 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 power with Godhead and the centurion saw that even in his obscurity, in his lowliness, in his humiliation, in his powerlessness on the cross, Jesus was different to anything, different to Caesar. He was truly the Son of God. A declaration made by a pagan Roman that Jesus was God's work. Jesus was something special that God was doing. Jesus was truly the Son of God. I've told this story before. I don't know for sure whether it's entirely true. I'm not going to claim that it's true. It may be at least in part apocryphal, so take it as you may. It's a story of a, a, a couple who went as very early missionaries to work in a remote part of our world where sanitation, where disease was a natural part of their lives. They laboured in that place. They felt called by God to go. They shared God's love in that context. They paid the price for that. They lost two children to the diseases in that country that they were in and mourned them as they buried them in that place where they served God. Even the wife succumbed to disease. And so after years and years of faithful servant service, the man returned home on the ship and uh, found that when he arrived home, there was a great parade of people waiting, streamers and bands playing and thought to himself as he carried his suitcases, all of his worldly possessions contained therein, what a wonderful welcome home until someone said to him, no, this is not for you, this is for some celebrity that's on the ship. And as the story goes, he put the suitcases down and he cried out to God and said, is this all there is? All of these years of work, all of these years of labour, all of this heartache and pain and grief, and this is what I come home to, nothing. And in that moment, God said to him, you're not home yet. That's the crazy God that we serve. He's got so much more in store for us through Christ and what Christ has done for us. And as we've seen our world turned upside down, turned on its head even in the last month to six weeks, God is right there saying, you know what, I am the unchanging God. I do stuff that might look to you like craziness, but I'm going to work good through this. I'm going to bring about my purposes through this. In the moments when we dwell on our failings and our shortcomings, and we say, I'm not sure that I can do this, God. I don't know what, why would you even ask me to do this? God says, I chose you because I can work through your weakness. That's our crazy God at work. And when we look around at the challenges of our world and the task of being Christ to the community around us, we might say, how are we ever going to do that? And God says, I go with you. I go before you. I go with you. I'm coming behind you and I'll supply what you need. And in the midst of this ugliness and this brutality of the cross, God was acting God was doing a work of beauty, a work of restoration as the soldiers were literally tearing the flesh from Jesus' body. As the nails were driven into his hands, he was freeing us from the chains of sin. This crazy God was giving us freedom. As Jesus hung on the cross being mocked by those who stood by, God was making a way for us to be free and to know freedom forevermore in him. And that's the invitation of Good Friday, to dwell again in that place where God won for us the victory. In that moment, Satan thought it was his greatest moment. He's finally defeated the Son of God, only to discover a couple of days later that uh, Jesus overpowered sin and overpowered death, that we might have life. That's the invitation of Good Friday, from our crazy God to have life. Let's pray, and I invite you into that space where if you know God, to say thank you for what he's done. But if you don't know God, to invite him to do that crazy work in your life too of freeing you from the weight and burden of guilt and sin that sits on your shoulders to know life in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you again for the cross. We can't, as having not witnessed the brutality of it ourselves, imagine what it was like. In some senses, some of our cinematography has captured a bit of it, but it's nothing like what it would have been to be there. 
even dwelling on it, Lord, we feel squeamish at the brutality and the awfulness. But again, we want to say thank you that you went to that place for us, that you chose to walk that road of punishment on our behalf because you knew that it was only by the sacrifice of one who never sinned, Jesus Christ, that we might, who have sinned, be free from sin, be free from guilt, be free from that oppression that we've lived under. We thank you for that, Lord. Father, we thank you that we know that. We thank you too, Lord, that you speak to those who may not know that. And today, Good Friday, we pray that for anybody who doesn't know you, who's not experienced that freedom in Christ, might today reach out to you and discover afresh what you are saying, the invitation that you are making, the love that you are expressing, and so know new life in Christ. We give you thanks for that and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.